Okay? Can you hear me? Oh, this is working. Great. This is so light. I can't imagine like there's something attached to my head that I can speak into. Um, my name is Martin Fackler. I'm the Tokyo Bureau Chief for the New York Times. And welcome to our session, which will be a post-modern Japan. Um, first, I want to say thank you to the Asan Institute, to uh, Ham Che Bong and his crew. You guys have once again put together a wonderful conference, and I think uh, you, know, you really have uh, put Asan Institute on the map, and also uh, South Korea on the map in some ways. Um, as a participant in kind of global dialogue on issues, and I really think you guys do a great job, and so thank you again for a, a wonderful conference. Um, we've been hearing at today's plenum about sort of the re-emergence or the re-eruption of history, right? We had this notion that history ended with the end of the Cold War and that liberal democracy and free trade had won and peace would reign. But now we're hearing about how history is still with us in the form of nationalism and rising nationalism, in the form of uh, rising disputes over views of history, and in the form of territorial disputes. Um, and we've heard about the potential for conflict that this brings. And so today's panel, this current panel, I think is an opportunity to talk about uh, one of the countries that's come up that's very central to this, which is Japan. Um, you know, after World War II, Japan reinvented itself, or perhaps was reinvented by Douglas MacArthur, into a country that had forsaken militarism, that was anti-militaristic. It was a country that became very pacifistic, uh, focused on economic development. I recently read a book about uh, Hirohito, the Showa emperor, and in it, it recounted an episode where, speaking of MacArthur, one of the meetings between Douglas MacArthur and Hirohito during the occupation of Japan in 19, um, this particular meeting took place in 1946, a year after Japan's defeat. And in it, MacArthur is recorded as having told Hirohito that a century from now, because of this pacifist constitution, Japan will become a moral leader in the world. Now, here we are almost 70 years after that conversation, and we're seeing Japan talking very seriously and the Japanese leadership talking very seriously about changing that constitution. And particularly changing Article 9, the part of the constitution that talks about renouncing uh, war as a means of resolving international disputes. Um, and not just revising the constitution, we hear a lot about, we hear people talking about Japan rearming, Japan remilitarizing, Japanese nationalism, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and there is definitely a broader narrative that's taking shape of, that has taken shape of Japan shifting to the right, of Japan becoming more nationalistic. Uh, and we saw that in this morning's video, if, if, for those of you at the morning session, uh, when they were listing all of these sort of, uh, you know, uh, problems of uh, history, uh, the, the reemergence of history, when they, for example, showed revisionism was one of the problems that came up on the video. We saw images of Prime Minister Abe visiting Yaskuni Shrine. Um, and so, and, and of course, Prime Minister Abe himself has talked of ending Japan's post-war regime, changing the constitution or the interpretation of the constitution, seeking a larger regional role for Japan, uh, and presenting more positive views of his own nation's history. So I guess the, the question I really would like to look at today is, you know, what is really changing in Japan? You know, is, it, is this, this whole sort of description of Japan as going to the right and becoming more nationalistic, is this true? What merits does it have? And what is really happening in Japan? So I will now introduce our four speakers and I will ask them to speak for five minutes each. And please forgive me in advance if I cut you off at five minutes. I do uh, wanna, wanna have this, I, I, I hope this becomes a real discussion and not just a series of presentations, though the presentations are important. So let me first um, introduce our speakers really quickly. Uh, on my left is Brad Glosserman, who is the executive director of the Pacific Forum of CSIS in, Hon in Honolulu. To his left is Miyake Kunihiko, who, uh, who is the research director at the Cannon Institute for Global Studies 
and is a former top diplomat at the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Nope. Um, to his left is uh, Pak Chul Hee, who is the director of the Institute of Japanese Studies at Seoul National University. And last, but certainly not least, is uh, Yamaguchi Noboru, who is the director of the International Program at the National Defense University, and is a former Lieutenant General in the Ground Self-Defense Forces. So without further ado, I will hand the floor over to Brad. Thank you, Martin. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I would have thought that, essentially, I figured out that history means Japan, so I'm sort of surprised this isn't an overflow crowd with people hanging from the rafters. Mm -hmm. I have no idea, or at least I didn't think I knew what postmodern Japan is, but I think that the conclusions I've come to will undermine the entire purpose of this forum and will run counter to every other speaker you'll hear, you've heard and you'll hear over the next couple of days. A couple of quick caveats. One. This is based, the conclusions I base are, are based on book research. I've done two books, one that's coming out with Scott Snyder, who's somewhere in the back of the room, coming out next year, and another one that I'm still looking for publisher. Two, no one in Japan makes the points that I'm about to make. Yoshi Soeya comes close with his middle power argument, but it's not exact. Japan is not a middle power, it's too big. Three, the current leadership in Tokyo and probably DC will completely disavow these marks. I'm sure that I will give Cooney a stroke with some of the things I'm about to say, so I apologize in advance. Um, the realities of Japan, hard realities, are it is a small, vulnerable country. It is the grayest country on earth with a population over 25% or age 65 and older, and it'll reach 40% by 2060. The population is shrinking from 127 million to reach 90 million by 2060, and its total debt is anywhere between 220 and 280% of GDP. It is a country that, by f formal, physical measures, is in trouble. And I would argue, secondly, more importantly, so too is it in terms of its attitude. My research over the last couple of years and my experience in Japan over two decades has led me to believe that the Japanese people today want, the overwhelming majority of Japanese would like a small country. For them, they wish to go beyond history. And the lessons that they've learned from history are completely counter, I would argue, to that of most of the assumptions that undergird this conference. You know, and this is fairly, I think, remarkable, given Japan's modern history, the compelling national success, the compelling national uh, myth of nation building, the homogenous country. And I think it is very much, the conclusions I reach are an outgrowth of two decades of confusion, of a lost national narrative. If you were gonna come up with a title for this speech, I think it would have been model to muddle and back again to model, um, if anyone's thinking of a, of a movie version. Um, <laughs> The takeaway from so much of this, and I, in five minutes I can do very little, so I obviously depend on, on, on questions to tease this out, is that there is an aversion to competition in Japan. In competition on every level, there is an aversion to great power politics. There is a weariness, a wariness, a skepticism that comes with being a great power. Almost none of the Japanese I speak to want to be a great power and want to pay great power political games, and much of that is an outgrowth of the experience of World War II and the Imperial Era. There is a reluctance as well to compete in economics, and this is a whole lot of reasons for this, but essentially I think what you have is a happiness paradox where the Japanese, particularly the young people in Japan, look at their country and look at their parents and look at older generations and realize that they have worked and built this extraordinary country are extremely unhappy. They do not see a great future ahead of themselves, and so they see the future that they wish to adopt and the one that they would, would prefer is one that is a smaller, more comfortable, less competitive Japan. Now this, I think, combines as well with a Shinto narrative, with an environmental perspective, you know, a, 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 a richness of, or a sense of identification, which if you look at the polls that talk about who the Japanese are and, and what makes them who they are, it is a sense of environmental uh, 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 connection. There is, if you look at all of the opinion polls, very little preference for laissez-faire economics. And so, you know, if you look at, for example, the starting point for the Abe political program, which is the revitalization of the Japanese economy, particularly through the Abenomics, which in turn requires structural reform, and for, for example, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, you have no popular support for that. Not in terms of the big picture, what it's all for, or even the little picture. This is a social democratic country that wants everybody to be equal and does not believe in the hard-edged competition that defines laissez-faire economics and defines so many of the structural reforms that are required to make Japan a first-tier country or to keep it in that first tier. 
I would argue that some of this is what I call a betrayal by modernity. It is a, a, a result, I said, of this happiness paradox, the myth of a safe society, the environmental costs that have come from, from, from environmental um, uh, develop or economic development, and all of the failures, the, the systemic failures, political, corporate, bureaucratic, were driven home by the, by the March 11th crisis. Um, the Japanese people, as I speak to them, particularly the young folks, are just not interested in maximizing their efficiency. You speak to them and they all tell you, we're just too damn comfortable. We like the lives we have and we're not prepared to do a lot more to make ourselves richer. Richness hasn't worked in our behalf. Similarly, on the great power piece, I think if you look, and, and, and this may anticipate some of your questions, Martin, about nationalism. Nationalism in Japan is non-existent. For all of the studies of uniqueness, the Japanese will tell you, a fascinating poll by the Asahi Shimbun last December showed that if the Japanese were in, invaded by a foreign country, 15% of people under the age of 20 would be we would say that they would fight in defense of their nation. The highest percentage was over 70 year olds and that was only 35% of them. If you want to talk about nationalism, even the Japanese that identify themselves as nationalists, most of them say nationalism for them is an identification with the land, with the environment. 10% of them say that nationalism is rooting for a sports team. It is certainly not this love of the emperor, it is not a defense of national uh, uh, pride, etc., that comes with uh, the traditional attributes and the traditional formulations of nationalism. Where this all takes you, I think, is essentially, and, and I think we're almost out of time, yeah. right? Yeah. What it takes you to is a small Japan economy, a country that I think is prepared to get smaller, that is prepared to be anti-consumerist, anti-consumption, that is prepared, on the other hand, by virtue as well as being the lessons of history, to be more deeply integrated into Asia. It is prepared to take the Datsua, you know, the question of going out of Asia back in the Meiji era, and to go back in as part of the alliance, but as part of a larger um, organic whole, if you will, as Japan is part of, the, uh, a part of the region in a way that allows it to export its good behavior, to be an international leader, this is the model piece again, but in ways that, are the that, that e exploit and exhibit what is Japan can do best, which is be green, be efficient, learn to live with less, leave a small footprint, be a good small country. There's a lot more to it, but there's no more time. Great. Thank you very much, Brad. <laughs> All right, Kuni, do you want to Kuni? go next? Yes. Uh, I also like to echo the uh, previous speakers in expressing the deepest, deepest uh, condolences and sympathy for, for the victims. I, I was so saddened. Anyway, really. But, uh, so I have only 4 minutes and 30 seconds. So, <laughs> and uh, i like to uh, share, because we have a great, uh, wonderful representative of Japan at the end of this uh, uh, lines. I would uh, like to give you uh, the uh, impression, my personal impression about my country, as if I were uh, 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 somebody uh, 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 non-Japanese, non-Korean, non-Chinese, non uh, Asian, somewhere in this part of the world. You know, Japan is not young anymore. Japan is not strong anymore. As Brad said, you know, we are not as reckless as before anymore. We are not ambitious anymore. We just want to age gracefully. <laughs> I'm at, you know, 60 years old. I just want to age gracefully. <laughs> you know, with all the mistakes we made, we want to be respected, and we want to age gracefully. But at the same time, we don't want to disappear. We want to survive, because you still have, I have some life to go. So there's a huge uh, power shift is going on in our, our part of the, your part of the world. So I really want to survive, you know, I don't want to die there. But it doesn't mean that we're going to be young again, we're going to be strong again. No, never. This is, there's some generational uh, shift uh, in my country, or not, I shouldn't say, in their country, in <laughs> Japan. Uh, for example, Ambassador Togo uh, uh, belongs to his generation, not mine. He's a bit senior to me, and I, with all my respect to you, uh, his generation is much uh, liberal if not leftist. Uh, uh, not he, but uh, more anti-American and pro-communism generation. But 
his generation is disappearing or retiring. I'm sorry, you are not representing. My generation, I was born in 1953, in the early 50s. Those student movements are gone on campus. Okay, so campus got back to normal. We have classes, we have exams. Oh my God, you know, I wasn't prepared. <laughs> so I, I studied hard, but that was the uh, uh, turning point. That was 1973. It was a turning point. But having said that, Japan is also changing, in my view. I just uh, visited Europe uh, just a few weeks ago. I had, there's one representative from Europe, but I have visited a different uh, group of countries. And uh, I, I don't want to be misunderstood, but, oh my God, if there are six European countries, there are at least six different kinds of histories. And those histories are not the same. Of course, some, some overlap. And uh, when I especially visited the uh, Czech Republic, or I could see the Swedish, Swedes are just invading that, that part of the world some time ago, several centuries ago. So it's, it's a full of uh, history issues there. And of course they manage, and I try to do the same. But uh, even Germany, if, if there's any German, I, I'm sorry, I apologize in advance, they are pardoned, but they are not forgotten. Really, I, I, somebody told me that, and I, I, I think that's, that's a correct, uh, uh, so it won't go away. And the reason why I'm telling you this is that I'd like to tell you why national, nationalism is back. It's, it's not the Putin did. It's a quite natural thing to go, to do. Because human beings don't change quickly. We are human beings. And of course, I also believe in uh, 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 postmodernism to a certain extent. But it's not completely right, or it's not completely wrong. But still, nationalism is there. So I think I'm getting to believe, beginning to believe that maybe we should live with nationalism. And we should, it's not, demonizing nationalism is not going to be a solution. I think it's the best way is to live with it and hopefully control it, manage it. How can we manage the uh, comeback boy nationalism after seven <coughs> decades of uh, uh, frozen or contained situation? They are back. It's, they are back everywhere in Europe and probably back here as well. So let's face it. We have nationalism and let's manage it, control it. How can we do it? I think. Uh, in a nutshell, because I have already spent four minutes and 30 seconds, <laughs> one word, universal values. Let's keep universal values, including democracy, human rights, rule of law, uh, freedom, and uh, humanitarianism, or right to uh, uh, self-determination, I would add that, to control it. I think we can do that. Japan is not that naive. We are not uh, uh, that young anymore. We are getting more and more mature. And we know, we are not, I was in Baghdad in 2003 uh, and four when the Americans kindly imposed another constitution to Iraqis. But at that time, we were regaining democracy back in 1950s. We were a democracy in the early uh, uh, 20th century. That's why it, it took us a, a very short period of time to get back to democracy, which, I'm sorry, Iraqis can't, because they, are, they had no democracy before. So I think as long as we keep our democracy intact, I believe that we'll be able to control and manage nationalism. But if you don't have 
nationalism, oh, excuse me, democracy, it's a different story. Look at Russia. Putin is ruling everything. And look, I don't want to name other countries, but if you have democracy, you can control it. And if you don't, you're more inclined to, 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 to uh, 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 have a bad effect uh, out, of, out of the, uh, the uh, violent, more ugly uh, 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 nationalisms. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Professor Park, do you want to? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, why, why history matters? Why we are talking about the history issues in, in, at this historical critical juncture? I think uh, history matters, especially when it comes to Japan, uh, that uh, this is a kind of stumbling block that uh, at least slow, slow down the cooperation potential among United States, Korea, and Japan, also bilateral cooperation between Korea and Japan, also Northeast Asian Triangle, China, Japan, and Korea. History card or history issues actively or reluctantly played. That's the reason why we are all talking about these history issues. Then why, why at this juncture? Because Abe's Japan looks different from the past. Uh, I think we were too much addicted by the liberal, the democratic party of Japan's Japan. Uh, which was very much uh, dependent about Japan's historical past, and then um, tried to apologize, uh, even though it's not fully acceptable, still very apologetic. But uh, Abe's Japan looks, sounds very differently. Then why, why, Japan, why Abe's uh, Japan looks very provocative, especially in the eyes of the Koreans? I would say that obvious uh, strategy and then uh, politics has a strong element and then weak element. I just wrote one uh, edited volume uh, together with other scholars, a uh, uh, Japan specialist, and then found that obvious external strategy is highly strategic, especially when it comes to the global scene. Uh, trying to promote uh, democracy and market economy, rule of law, and human rights issues, and the on the global scene, and then trying to be actively pro contributed to the Chilean, Chilean the, the protecting Chileans of communication, and other uh, the global commons. Also, I is very strong in promoting the national agenda within Japan. They try to encourage uh, their national pride and confidence uh, among the Japanese people. Try to boost up the, its economy. But this, the, the second part is sometimes negatively twisted to provoke the, its, its immediate neighbors. What is, close, what is uh, critically missing in, his, in Abe's strategy is that how to reshape this East Asian regional architecture. I, I don't think he has a clear regional strategy. Even though he, he says it, I don't find it. Because uh, he has, uh, what he has in mind is how to balance the rising China. He's, I think he's successfully doing it. But how to engage its closest neighbors like uh, South Korea and also growing China? I don't think he has a clear picture about how to do, it, do with it. That's the reason why he's embarrassed. And then that is much more embarrassed. Uh, we are much more embarrassed by this, the absence uh, of a, his regional strategy. So I, I wanted to find his uh, kind of positive element in his strategy, but I, sti I still couldn't find it. But, uh, but I'm not that much pessimistic about uh, current Japan but because there is a kind of a mismatch. We, we titled this session as a post, in parentheses, modern Japan. I would say that current Japan is like a kind of a new Mediterranean, Mediterranean age. Tanakaki applied this concept to whole East Asia, the, uh, the coexistence of modern, pre-modern, uh, post-modern countries. I think uh, within Japan, there is a postmodern, modern, pre-modern elements are all mixed at this moment. I think uh, Abe's basic uh, defense and security strategy is quite modern, in a sense that uh, Japan, Japan, Abe's Japan wants to cope with the rising China with a very proactive defense strategy, 
and trying to raise its defense capability for internal balancing, also try to strengthen uh, the US-Japan alliance for external, external balancing. That's quite understandable. That's, that's by modern standard. Every country is doing it. So this is quite modern practice that we can never blame. But I think most of uh, the ordinary Japanese mass on the ground are pretty much pre-modern rather than more than modern. <laughs> the, in a sense that they enjoy their, you know, yeah, they wanted to age graceful, gracefully, enjoy a very high standard of, the other, of, of consumption, environmentally clean, and then good elderly care, and then uh, work in uh, the village in the local community. This is a highly pre-modern. I think uh, I, the Japan is a kind of the good model of post-modern the Asia. I think uh, Korea should be modeled after. Uh, so pre, that, that's pre good. Pre-modern or mod, uh, post-modern? Uh, post-modern. Post -modern. But the, the very the, the confusing thing is that we find a strong, gradually growing pre-modern element in the Japanese society, which are much more right-winged. Uh, they advocate very chauvinistic, the exclusively nationalistic, like we see in the hate speech, or kind of advocating Japanese unique norms that other countries can hardly accept. This is, I think, a, even a, they have a strong pre-modern element. So that confuses us. But if it is a kind of a post-modern only, or modern only, yes, possibly you can cope with it. But this very ideationally right-wing elements of the Japanese society, we can hardly accept it. <clears throat> so the, I will talk about it if, if, the, if more chances, more uh, uh, times are given. So I think there's a, some kind of mismatch even between the Japanese leaders and Japanese electorates. Okay. So the, that's, the, that's the kind of uh, the problem. Finally, I, I just wanted to add one more point that uh, the, regardless of Japan or Korea or China, what we are all missing, or uh, we, what is losing is that we are not talking about image in the future community. The, uh, just China has been trying to get over this uh, century-old humiliation and then trying to go back to the glory of the past. Japan wants to retrieve its golden days by making economically and militarily strong. But it's a kind of story of the past. This nationalism is basically, basically based on imagining the past community. So that's the reason why all this rhetoric goes to nationalism and talking about the past. But all these three countries, unlike the European Union, we're not talking about the visions and future and shared communities of this region, of the future. So I think that's the critical missing element in this region that we have to develop in the future. I'll stop there. Great, thank you. Mr. Yamaguchi. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, before getting started, I, I'd like to, to echo uh, Kuni uh, on my condolence uh, to the victims. And also I'd like to, to share my admiration uh, for the rescuers as well as the volunteers, uh, ordinary people, volunteers to help the family members waiting for rescue operation. I, I have a high admiration of that. And actually, I'm the most militaristic. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, General. Right. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, uh, my, I have a theory that the professionals uh, tend to be less extreme uh, than the, uh, others. So I, I try to be uh, really dry. And as to modernity and postmodernity, uh, you know, my conclusion is very simple. And Japan was really good at uh, uh, getting to, uh, to modernity, getting modernity. And it was based on the voluntary base. Uh, in the, during the Meiji Restoration and after, afterwards, uh, really, Japan, Japanese were really, really good at, uh, good at uh, becoming a modern, uh, modern community. But the, in terms of uh, postmodernity or departure from, uh, departure from modernity, I have doubt. Uh, even, even, uh, even though Japan may be a, a, a postmodern uh, society, it's not necessarily a voluntary basis. It's not based on the volunt uh, volunteer. Uh, let me explain uh, some, uh, some of this. Uh, and the modernity is, uh, uh, according to uh, uh, Masao Maruyama, uh, one of the uh, most liberal uh, po uh, political scientists in Japan, uh, according to Maruyama-san, uh, modernity is the basis for nationalism, political realism, and democracy. 
um, in this in, in in these terms, Japan was really good uh, at the uh, um, uh, doing successful uh, in achieving uh, such basis uh, after uh, during and after the major restoration. I uh, I have full admiration to to Yuki, uh, Yukichi Fukuzawa, uh, who is the founder of Keio University, uh, from uh, from uh, from which uh, we uh, I see some of the uh, some of the the graduates here, and he 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 wrote a book. Uh, Gakumon no Susume, Encourage of Learning. Uh, that was a textbook for enlightenment um, uh, uh, activity in Japan after um, 18, uh, 1870s. Um, Japanese were very much uh, quickly enlightened uh, by, uh, by that movement. In addition, uh, Japanese government introduced uh, conscript army and the, uh, um, the uh, compulsory education system um, by uh, that those systems worked well to to nationalize uh, the people as opposed to as opposed to uh, the loyalties that old clans feudal system. So as uh, as the Japanese, uh, Japanese uh, before 1868, there is no such a thing as the Japanese. But after 18, 1868, uh, Jap uh, Japanese uh, quickly became uh, uh, Jap uh, Japanese uh, Japanese national. In this respect, uh, state Shintoism um, was used for promoting nationalism and may have caused an extreme belief uh, of an uh, emperor-centered Japan as a divine country. That may, uh, that may be uh, having the, the effect uh, uh, to this date. On the other hand, uh, departure from uh, departure from uh, modernity, uh, perhaps uh, particularly uh, departure from um, political realism and departure from overcoming ideo ideological uh, confrontation and the, uh, achieving real liberal democracy are not necessarily uh, made, by, uh, uh, made from inside Japan, but rather made by the end of the Second World War. And it was a kind of accidental. That, that, have, uh, th that fact has caused uh, two, two tendencies. Uh, one is uh, because it was accidentally given, so um, the Japanese may not uh, uh, cherish uh, the sort of value of postmodernity. Uh, it was given. It's uh, it's ours. That so um, the Japanese tend uh, tend uh, tend to not uh, not uh, uh, respect or uh, cherish that value. And other uh, other uh, effect is uh, Japanese uh, without reflection uh, within ourselves uh, we uh, became uh, came into the uh, modernity. Without re reflection of modern, uh, modern Japan, uh, we, we, we became the uh, post-modernity um, by accident. So I, um, um, the Japan, uh, Japanese may have lacked uh, the process uh, to, to look, back, uh, look back the uh, mistakes by uh, modern, uh, modern state uh, uh, as a Japan as a modern state. <coughs> So uh, those may uh, have been the reasons why uh, Japanese are not uh, necessarily good at uh, looking, uh, looking back the history. And also I have, I have to agree with uh, Ambassador Togo saying that education uh, of Japan is a, a problem. Uh, in my personal case, uh, in, uh, up until uh, college, I have, um, you know, uh, in, in the uh, high school age, I uh, learned a lot about Japanese history. But that is up to the major restoration. Afterwards, um, you know, I, I was busy preparing for uh, entrance examination in university. And when I learned uh, history in the last 100 years, it's a four years uh, college, uh, college life uh, in, in the National Defense Academy. Uh, it's a voluntary base. So um, the education uh, has a problematic uh, aspect as well. I'll stop here. Thank you. I think, uh Thank you for the presentations, and I think I see really two strands of thinking. One is this issue of nationalism that we've talked about in the beginning, and the other is this question of whether Japan is some sort of a model or what sort of model Japan has. If I can go into the first question first, um, uh, and if I can address this to Kuni, you mentioned that J nationalism is back, you said. I think it's one of the things you said. Um, and you said we have to live with it and manage it. To what, what is it, when we talk about nationalism is back in Japan, what does it mean? I, I mean, never said that nationalism is back in Japan okay. alone. It's back globally. And uh, what I saw 
of what you saw in Crimea or Ukraine and Hungary, France, even UK have lots of hints of uh, rise of nationalism. So it is universal and uh, in this part of the world there's no exception. I don't want to go into details because it would take a long, long time. But there's no country without nationalism rise at this moment. But is it fair to say that with this, this narrative that we see, uh, uh, Japan is becoming more nationalistic, right? And this, the, the video this morning of Japan revisionism and ultranationalism and these images of Abe at Yaskuni, there's okay. definitely a perception that Japan is moving to the right, that Japan is moving in this sort of scary nationalistic direction. Is that accurate, fair? I, I just wonder what your thoughts uh, are on that. Uh, Ralph Kosa used a, a beautiful word, sloppy journalism. <laughs> so, I really, really like that. Beautiful uh, wording. Uh, I'm not talking <laughs> about New York Times. <laughs> um, and you too uh, must have read some of those pieces of uh, article. Um, yes, uh, we have some idiots. I, I do not disagree. It's everywhere. Uh, hate crime, you said, or hate speeches. Yes, but most of the silent majority of Japanese do not even hear, haven't even heard. I haven't heard it. It's only in uh, Shinokubo area, mm -hmm. and you have to go there, and you have so many young Japanese ladies uh, crazy about the Korean uh, culture, and they're shopping around. And those speeches must have been spoken somewhere, and uh, nobody listened. So if it's easy to pick up the pieces, just exaggerate, and put it on the air, on the print. That's fine. But you, we have to be able, because we are intellectuals, we have to be able to distinguish the real dangerous nationalistic elements and the rest. And the rest are not as uh, dangerous as you think. Brad, do you want to? Because I've th thought about, I mean, why are we talking about nationalism in Japan? It's not because of some great movement, it's because we have a, a validly conservative prime minister with an agenda, right? That's really it. And so I thought one of the, the best explanations for the Abe agenda, and I mean, there's, there's personal reasons, there's, I think, strategic reasons, there's political reasons. But one of the pieces that, that that's a, a Japanese um, uh, academic explained to me who then said, look, I'm not a backing the prime minister. But the reason he talks the way he does is because he has to write a national narrative that convinces a public that is anti-militarist and pacifist, largely, for whatever the reason, that they need to be prepared to fight and die for their country. That they need to be prepared to take on international responsibilities. And that's the way he couches it. It's not about Japan reclaiming lost territory. It's about fulfilling its responsibility as a leading country in the world. Now, this is a different issue than the one I raised, but if that's the case, you've got to give your public a reason to fight. And that's what, I think that's a fairly compelling explanation. And it's not ominous, mysterious, or nefarious at all. Well, another thing, it's 30 seconds. Nationalism is something to be reciprocated and augmented, amplified, mutually. It's not a one-way street thing. And uh, I don't want to name those countries, but you know which countries I'm talking about. And <laughs> something happens that would influence the other side, and that could be uh, reciprocated by the other. It's a chain reaction. So that's why we have to stop it. And it's not only Japan, but other countries have a similar tendency. In other, some countries, it's much more dangerously than in Japan. Professor Pak, you said that um, Abe's Japan looks different from the Japan of the past. Is, is there, what, what is your view? I mean, is there a dangerous nationalism, which a, a term that I hear used in China, Korea, and also on the editorial pages of my own newspaper? <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to make a quick comment on Kuni's point about Shinokubo. I, I, I frequently go to Shinokubo I uh, to, to enjoy, sometimes to watch. Uh, yes, there is a kind of a very many, a large number of uh, the Korea Wave fans there, uh, mostly females. Mm -hmm. But from last year, 
there's a kind of decrease of those visitors to uh, Shinoko where a very 40 to 50 percent. That's right. I agree. Sharply decli declining. And then they cannot speak out. They cannot say that they love Korean culture because they, they are, they are right wings who are vociferously mm -hmm. raising against them. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't want to uh, kind of draw a picture that the whole Japan is a kind of right wing. But no, I'm not talking about it. I'm not... I'm talking about this negative effect of a very noisy minority in the Japanese society yeah. that gives a kind of very negative signal to to neighboring country like Korea. Uh, they were very much uh, relatively silent during when uh, when Japan tried to invite the Tokyo Olympic Games. After that, they revived. So that's the kind. That's what is happening. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not blaming uh, Japan. Uh, but as for the kind of the nationalistic future of uh, uh, the the Japan. As I, as I told you in the beginning, I don't think Japan, entire Japan is nationalistic. I just said, I, I say that there's a kind of about 10% of the very right-wing Japanese. How do you know? In the, in the Tokyo governor election in, in March, the Tamogami gained 600,000 votes, which is about 10% of the voters. They are heavily right-winged. I would say, if you deny that, I don't want to discuss more. Uh, so the so it's a kind of there's a, a definitely a right wing element in the Japanese society. So the but uh, the former uh, that Japanese politician the, the Kato Goichi categorized the nationalism in three ways: uh, very healthy nationalism, talking about the pride of a nation, competitive nationalism, kind of uniting the country against the neighboring countries or other countries, and very unhealthy degenerative. Nationalism. I'm talking about the last one, mm -hmm. like a kind of a hate speech, and then try say that uh, uh, kill Koreans or rape Koreans in a, in public space, which is quite unacceptable by any standard. So this degenerative nationalist argument is on the rise, whether you uh, agree with me or not. So that's a kind of warning, a very worrisome kind of phenomena. I don't think most, I don't think the Japanese themselves are supportive of that. But they are very much preoccupied of their way or own way of thinking and do not want to change. That's the problem. So the, uh, I, I, rather than me blaming that phenomena, I hope the Japanese intellectuals stand up and speak out that that's wrong. That's, that's what I wanted to see. I will stand up. Yeah. <laughs> I will stand up. Yeah. And actually, I, I I, I'm a nationalist. <laughs> I'm a very patriotic person. And I, um, I am ready to risk my life uh, for, uh, for defense of Japan. And the, that is exactly what other nationalists, um, the other countries' nationalists do. So I respect Chinese nationalists, I respect Korean nationalists uh, who, uh, who are patriotic to the nation and who are uh, ready to risk their lives uh, for their country. If uh, there, there are any nationalists uh, who, uh, who, who make a, a kind of hate speech or uh, that's, that is not uh, a nationalist at all to, uh, to me. That is unhealthy uh, nationalist, and those nationalists is uh, against our national interest. And interestingly, um, I, I have been in, in uniform uh, for uh, nearly 40 years, and the, uh, at that time I, I found uh, other militaries, like, uh, of course, Korean military, even uh, Chinese military. We share common value. Uh, we, we, we are ready to risk the, the, our lives uh, for our country. Only difference is which country. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, so it is actually easy to communicate uh, with uh, military people. Uh, even under the uh, Cold War period uh, with Soviet, uh, Soviet uh, um, uh, military forces, um, I had, I had a very good time uh, to share experience in dealing with soldiers, uh, dealing with uh, lack, of, uh, lack of fuel for training. Uh, those uh, kinds of things. Uh, now I'm teaching at National Defense Academy, young cadets uh, 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 experiencing uh, this uh, again. Uh, we have, um, we have 1,500 uh, cadets at, at my academy, uh, four-year academy, and we have uh, several Korean students, uh, while uh, uh, Japanese students are learning at the uh, Korean military academies, and they are friends. And the, uh, to, to, uh, I have to... Uh, to to, uh, uh, to tell you that uh, at the uh, entrance ceremony in the, at the beginning of uh, April, the representative of uh, foreign students, uh, there were 
the 25 foreign students uh, entering to the uh, freshman class. That was a Korean Air Force cadet. The very, very handsome looking. <laughs> and very looking sharp and obviously really smart. And uh, he, he has a full respect among uh, Japanese cadets as well as the faculty members. There's something that you said, Mr. Yamaguchi, and also that Brad said. That I wonder if there are two different layers here, because there's this question of nationalism and kind of this, we've been talking, we, it gets talked about as a negative thing, this sort of eruption of chauvinism, et cetera. But there's also this question of Japan becoming more normal, right? That, that, that the, the environment is changing, and you're talking about, Brad was talking about the need to convince people to do what may be in Korea with, with uh, conscription, right? With, with uh, young men all entering the military is actually somewhat a normal thing to do. Uh, perhaps in Japan it's not, but, but, but there seems to be two levels here, right? There's like this sort of longer trend normalization and then this question of kind of an emotional nationalism. I wonder if you could talk about the other separate, uh, how do you see that? They, they, are, they are totally separate. And, uh, one, one of the things that I, I forgot to mention is dignity. Uh, dignity uh, should be with nationalists. So without dignity, I, I don't call uh, them the sort of uh, real nationalist. So mm -hmm. uh, hate speech uh, is not uh, a way for the real patriotic nationalists uh, are doing. You wanna? No, no, I'm not sure where that question went. So, um. <laughs> okay. no, <I'm> good. <laughs> and there's also this issue though of Japan, kind of we're talking about pre-modern, modern, postmodern, modern, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of, it, it, it goes in a very different direction, so it's kind of hard to reconcile these two notions of nationalism and postmodern. But, uh, so it kind of a kind of change in of, of, of pace here, but a question. Japan, when we used to talk about the end of history, right? The whole Francis Fukuyama argument back at the end of the Cold War. Some people raised Japan as sort of this exception, right? That you had capitalism versus socialism, capitalism won. <laughs> But what about Japan? Japan's sort of this hybrid, right? It's the kind of a place where, that, where socialism worked almost. It's, it's this, it has the market economy, but also has this state-guided function to it. And then you had a 20-year doldrums where Japan seemed to lose its way. But yet here we are, you know, in, in 2014, Japan remains the third largest economy in the world. Uh, you know, despite its various problems, it remains a very comfortable place to live. I think Brad said maybe too comfortable. Um, do, is Japan a model? I mean, is, is, is there, does Japan offer something to the world still? Is, is it different qualitatively? I, I just wonder, because that's... You know, uh, I not, I'm not the scholar, so I don't know the difference between pre-modern or modern or post-modern <laughs> or whatever modern. <laughs> I have no idea. And it's, it's, it's a, to me, it's a, use, a waste of time. Because if you have freedom in your society, and if you have freedom of speech, you have all kinds of ideas, as you described. And it's, I won't be surprised if you have the something similar in the Korean society, because it is a democracy. So I particularly don't understand why uh, you focus on a specific group of people in a specific country like Japan without referring to their counterparts in your country. So that's why I'm, I'm very, very skeptical about this. If, uh, this you, kind if of you have any counterparts, <laughs> no, let me, let me, please tell me. <laughs> let me finish. Um, I think the uh, uh, nationalism, uh, when it comes to uh, my country, as I tried to explain that earlier, uh, you know, my, the generation above me, one generation senior to me, I have much more uh, uh, left-wing, uh, Marxist, uh, sort of a pro-communist tendency. There are always exceptions, of course. But in my generation, we have much, much less. We are uh, most apolitical. It's a political apathy sort of a generation. So for me, uh, uh, communism is not uh, 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 an attraction, uh, but um, of having uh, uh, looked back on the 70 years of the Japanese uh, uh, history since 1945, I would say that it has been heavily, heavily uh, tilted to the left, 
And uh, my understanding is that we are getting back to the center. I probably represent center right. But I think the silent majority of the Japanese are getting back to the center. But if you are located on the left, you see us tilting to the right. But it doesn't mean that we are going to far right. We are getting back to the center. And we know the limit. And we know how it works, because we are a democracy. Um, if I, well, Can I? Do you want to go ahead, let Park go ahead. Let's, let's, yeah. uh, Mr. Park yeah. first. Uh, uh, the, uh, I just wanted to link uh, the notion of uh, dignity with uh, what's happening. I think I, I, you're right. Dignity is the very essential element of nationalism. I, I had a very interesting uh, interview this January with the so-called leader of uh, new right wing. But he is the leader of uh, anti-hate speech, you know, Shino Okubo. Even though I was surprised, he, you are right wing, right? But you're against the hate speech. What happened? No, they don't have dignity. They are not Japanese. <laughs> they are simply a exclusionist, exclu yeah. exclusionist and then the kind of chauvinist. So they don't call them right wing. I am so ashamed if you call them right wing. So that's the kind <laughs> of the very good the symptom right uh, that, I, that I find. Other. But the problem here is that that anti-hate speech movement took place only one year after hmm. those uh, events were proliferating. One year. It took one year to, to see that right-wing anti-hate speech people. So I wanted to see it a little bit earlier and more wide. So that's the kind of simple point I wanted to make. And as for the kind of Japan becoming a normal country, I think uh, in Korea, we are in, in the previous session, we are talking about Japan becoming a military superpower or whatever. I think there is a kind of illusion in the Korean society that we always try to look at Japan in a negative way and then, and then conglomerate everything and then just the kind of all things related to Japan is bad. I don't agree to that idea. But the what, if I just look at Abe's current posture, he has two elements. Simply speaking, defense revisionism and history revisionism. I can understand the obvious defense revisionism in the context of rising China and assertive Chinese maritime strategy. But I cannot go with the history revisionism he's advocating. I don't know whether the United States can go with him uh, as far as the history issue is concerned, especially giving a Japanese people a pride and confidence. That's good. I am I, I, I'm, I'm for that idea. But Denying the historical facts, distorting, distorting historical facts, even glorifying the historical facts should never be accepted. Korean, Japanese, American, it doesn't matter. Uh, we have to be clear about that signal. If not, we are talking about all, the, all different issues. Brad? I agree. Mm -hmm. Two points. First, on, on, this, on, on democracy and, and uh, nationalism. And I think Kuni is absolutely right. I mean, as long as Japan is a democracy, no one should lose any sleep. I mean, uh, the, as my research suggested, I think everyone agrees, the overwhelming majority of Japanese people are peaceful. I mean, the problem, of course, is, is that they are abnormal. You know, you're trying to create a normal Japan, which is a probably more patriotic, nationalist country that would come closer to the norm, literally, as we consider it. The Uyoko have been with us, you know, for how many years? Crazy right-wing nuts in their sound trucks. This nationalism is not new. And I think, you know, the Tamagami 10% turnout in the Tokyo governor's election had, what, 27% turnout overall? So I think we overestimate the size of that particular group. So uh, as long as we believe that Japan is, in fact, a functioning democracy, that the, over, that the will of the people prevails, no one should lose any sleep. And in fact, I think, you know, we'll find, very likely, I mean, it, which takes me to the second point about Japan as a model. Abenomics is the key to everything. If this economics program fails, Abe, Abe is out in five months. I mean, the, the knives are out. There are people in his party that want him dead for all sorts of reasons, some of which are perfectly conservative social factors um, that tie to the small Japan ideas I like to get to. But if he fails on that, then he's gone and this whole nationalism discussion goes away, I have a feeling. You swing right back to the larger silent majority, the traditional LDP, the party as it's always existed. As Japan is a model, you know, Paul Krugman was saying, you know, that he wanted to reconsider the Japanese experience, that two decades, the Japanese have weathered two decades of stagnation like no other nation. 
And what an extraordinary model that is. You look at Europe's future, we look at the United States potentially with bumpy growth. Could we have weathered it as well as the Japanese political system has? And no. And of course, the reason for that is because the Japanese population is shrinking. And as a result, that means you can keep the same standard of living even if your economy doesn't grow. But the fact is, I think the ways that the Japanese address these issues, and again, this is a longer answer that takes even, gets even longer if I try to take that up, actually takes the Japanese into a really powerful model for a postmodern society in so many different ways, in ways that the Japanese can make very powerful contributions, that they can do all the things that we want them to do, do the things that they want to do, make the world better, you know, rah, 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 and uh, do it in ways that I think work for Japan, the region. And by the way, to go to, to Tohi's point, you know, if you go to Fukuoka, if you go to the western coast of Japan, they have a vision of Asia. Because, you know, you talk to businessmen in Fukuoka and they tell you we're closer to Busan, Seoul, Shanghai than we are to Tokyo. Our future is in Asia. There is a much deeper integrative impulse when you get out of Tokyo. Okinawa and there's a yeah, Okinawa much better way to look and see the way the, the region and the world looks uh, when you get out of the, Tokyo and, and that particular, you know, we talk about inside the beltway, um, inside the beacon, I suppose, is, uh, is, uh, has its own little limitations as well. Uh, I'll just uh, kind of introduce one anecdote. Uh, the, we are going to have a Korea-Japan forum uh, in uh, early August in Fukuoka. Hmm. And then uh, the, uh, the, we had just a straight steering committee because I'm a member. And then I was surprised to find that there is a kind of uh, at the welcoming reception, 1,000 businessmen in Fukuoka will turn up. What? 1,000? So this is kind of, so the, the linkage between the kind of local Busan, local Fukuoka is immense. They're deeply going which is a very good phenomenon that we have to encourage, so that uh, the locals are leading rather than the central government is leading. I, I always advise my Japanese politician friend, uh, you should be a follower rather than a leader. Leaders are screwing up. The, follow, the nation, people are leading the phenomenon. In Fukuoka, there is a, uh, there is a uh, regional Air Force headquarters. If you go there, you, you, you will find that black phone, big uh, old phone. If you pick up them, um, th that uh, phone, uh, you, can, you can hear Yoboseo. Um, <laughs> it's a, a real hotline uh, between uh, Korean, uh, Korean Air Force and Jap uh, Japanese JASA. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like to uh, uh, connotate what Brad said. Uh, uh, and uh, I'd like to explain to you uh, the uh, Japanese possible intellectual contribution uh, 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 to the global uh, sort of uh, civilization. Well, especially I want the uh, Westerners to listen to this. See, uh, you uh, refer to the Chinese sense of humiliation and trying to overcome the kind of humiliation uh, uh, which started, I believe, uh, 18, 1840, the Opium War. You know, Japan is no exception. Remember, the black ship came, and uh, we opened up the country. Then we made a deal with the Western powers. The, those treaties were not equal. So it took us almost a century to revise the unequal treaties with the Western powers, European powers, I would say, and American as well. So I think we, together with Korea and, and, and China as well, we are uh, the history of Japan since 1868 is a history of Japanese people who really wish to maintain the balance between the Western universal values or Western values, Christian values on the one hand and the traditional Asian culture. And there's a, there's a conflict, internal conflict inside. So in the case of China, for example, now, they just still stick to their Chinese traditional culture. But that's not enough in order to live in the 21st century, you have to maintain the balance between the universal values and the traditional values. But not totally traditional values, but not, not, not totally Western, because we are not Western. We are Asian. So our experience since 19, I would say 50s, since the black ships came, 
it, 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 it is a lesson itself how to reconcile the uh, traditional uh, Asian culture with the Western civilization. We're in our final 15 minutes, I see from the sign. Uh, if people from the audience have anything you'd like to say, uh, I only ask that you keep it brief, okay? Uh, let me go with um, Mindy first. I think you had your hand up next, and then maybe th and then the gentleman over there will do three first. Like, let me, let's do two rounds. Okay, I'll try keep to it be, brief, please. Try to be quick. This is a question from Miyake, Mr. Miyake. Uh, recently, you wrote a very interesting article. Can, can you hear me? Um, very interesting article about um, it was in about that if Americans and others keep criticizing Abe and the Abe administration, something worse will come. Something more nationalistic, more conservative. It's a bit of a actually it's being echoed a lot in Washington, which is a theme that was post Yasukuni. Pre Yasukuni. Japanese would come to Washington and say, Abe is not conservative, he's actually really a socialist, actually he's quite <laughs> liberal. And then post Yasukuni, uh, and yours was the most articulate article, saying that if not Abe, something worse. What is the worst? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me get three questions first before you can answer. Next here. We'll just take a group of questions and then have the participants answer. Uh, yes, my question is, uh, isn't political apathy the worst threat to uh, Japan uh, a democracy. Uh, you mentioned, rightly, uh, education and dignity. Uh, about civism, the third leg, which might be missing, maybe, uh, because Abe's agenda is not nationalistic, but it's national. He wants to bridge the gap between the vast, uh, peaceful majority and the minority, tiny minority, which basically uh, imperial Japan loyalists who control the political system. So, and make and or unmake prime ministers. Um, so, isn't it, as you rightly pointed out, the fact that uh, nationalists uh, from all sides feed each other? Isn't it time for the moderates to speak up, really, but in mass, uh, to to, to protect you. and to save really Japan? Oh, thank you. And then one, one more. Again, please keep it brief. Okay, uh, my name is Naoki Yoshino from Japan. Uh, many people are talking about 20 years of recession of Japan. Main causes comes from aging population. And uh, many people live much, much longer than compared to other countries. And, but the Western people has suggested monetary policy should be changed and so on. Lower interest rate cannot help aging population. And I think uh, aging population is a very good lesson, lesson to China and Korea. Mm -hmm. And how to cope with the Japanese aging population will be a good lesson for Asia. Thank you. Thank you. So Japan is certainly a front runner in that. Uh, <laughs> Miyake-san, you want to answer the first question? Maybe uh, Brad, the second question? And yeah, the, 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 the third. Uh, too. Probably I, 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 my writing is not uh, a good one because I might have give, given you a, a, a wrong impression. What I, I was worried about is the simple demonization of Abe would only en enhance the xenophobic very small minority of xenophobic right-wingers uh, to grow. And I, that's what, uh, what uh, we should avoid. And what we need is a healthy, constructive, internationalist, conservative movement in my country. This is, uh, and, and in order to do that, our conservatives in my country had to go through uh, some kind of evolution. Uh, intellectual evolution. Uh, 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 that chance would be missed if uh, the simple uh, demonization continues. Brad, you want to try number two um, and three? Uh, on the apathy question, you're right. I mean, you know, the question for everyone in the room is, are, do we trust Japanese democracy? Do you think the majority will prevail? Because the majority will in Japan is benign. Um, and I think Kuni is absolutely right. And I think the task really for Japan's conservatives is to draw the lines. They have to, not us, not, not Cholhi, not anybody else has to draw the line as to what is acceptable and unacceptable speech. I mean, that's frankly in the United States, it's the same problem. Conservatives chase votes and are, are afraid to, and in other countries, afraid to antagonize their base. So it's up to us. I would just take issue, I don't think Japan's only problem is an aging population. 
I think it's a factor of productivity issues. Um, it has to do with a shrinking population as well, which is part of aging. It has to do with uh, an inability to mobilize women. Um, but you're absolutely right, and this is part of the postmodern agenda. That's what makes Japan a model. And, and its contribution is precisely its ability to deal with questions of aging populations, different demographic profiles, socialization, urbanization, blah, 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 blah. All those are ways that Japan can be a great international citizen, solve postmodern problems by setting an example and using its considerable resources uh, to both address it generally and specifically. This is how we do it. Let's work with you to, uh, to, to help that. And, and by the way, I mean, you know, the answer also, both in terms of the conservatives and in these drawing Japan and encouraging Japan's good behavior is don't paint with a broad brush. Be nuanced. Respond to the people that you think are responsible. Encourage them and marginalize the irresponsible ones. Okay, we're down to, I think, seven more minutes. Maybe one more round of questions from the audience. I think you had a question, right? Um, Number two, number three, okay. Somebody is in the back. Yeah, yeah, I think she had, it's behind Mindy, somebody, she, somebody, yeah, there she is. Uh, uh, my name is Myung Shin Kim. I have been working at, uh, uh, as a visiting professor abroad for 10 years from America and the Netherlands, UK and Slovakia. And the last moment, I was in the Middle East to explore those areas, to know America, to know Europe more, and to know our country, our country's unification in the future. So at this moment, we have to think the solution. Uh, 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 how can we get the uh, prosperity? and the cooperation together, to live together, coexist together in this Northern East Asia. So China, Korea, Japan should find the solution. At this mom moment, we should not have a political or historical or moral uh, uh, stance. We should find out the morality and the, our, uh, our responsibility of our history. And then we have to start from that stance. So at this moment, I, uh, I, I was very sad, actually. Uh, do, you a, do you have a question? Because we really don't have yes, time. Yes. I want to ask about the solution as a scholar, as a journalist, as a professional about this area, this regional studies. Everybody was invited in this uh, plenum because you are a scholar, you are professional. So I want to listen to your solution, your way to find out the solution in Eastern Asia. We sh our country should be reunified as soon as possible. Okay. We need uh, that so kind you, of... But you're asking for solutions to yes, these issues Yes, a solution and the history, okay. history text and also these okay, territorial thank yeah. issues. We got yes, it. Thank, thank you. you very much. I want to give the other people a chance to talk too. So we got a couple here. Right. I'm sorry. Where's the microphone? So the first question is uh, solutions, right? Fix this problem. Yeah. Okay. Second. All right, we're down to five minutes here. <laughs> Well, my name is Cha byung -il. I have a question to Kuni Miyake. Uh, Kuni was a, actually a Japanese trade negotiator. I was a Korean trade negotiator at W2 Beijing Telecom, 1995-1996. Oh, so we're sitting next to each other, so welcome back. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Well, uh, when I was listening to Kuni's interpreted history, I think you know, I, I was really afraid I was misheard because he representing, he was interpreting history from 1850 in Japan after you know, the advent of a black ship, the Kurohune, he was uh, interpreting that is uh, Western value versus Asian value. But Japan was, you know, really become modernized because Japan was abandoning Asian value. That's the way I interpret. The Japanese national strategy was escape from Asia and jumping into Western world. So, you know, that's the first question. Second question is, you kind of categorize there was Western value versus Asian value. Is it the way of, you know, correct interpreting what has happened in those years? Indeed, Asia has some common value. So that's my question to you. Okay, thank you. May I have one more question in the front here? Uh... I'm afraid that this is another question from another WTO member, negotiator. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. But actually... Uh, <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> yeah. You have lots of former negotiators. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the, um, the ultra-nationalist minority and the, whether the nationalist narrative actually fits within the postmodern uh, modernity. And I actually would like to turn the question other way around, and which is the question about why there isn't a globalist narrative in not only Japan, but also in Korea and other Asian societies beyond commerce and shopping. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Does someone want to try the first question? What can be done before I let uh, Kuni answer the second question? 
I, I answer the second question? Let me, let me have yeah. let me, uh, Okay, do the that. second one first. Yeah, you know, uh, in a nutshell, in the Meiji era, the intellectuals in Japan were divided into two schools of thoughts. One is, uh, we are Asians, Asia is one, and we belong to Asia. That's one school of thought. The second school of thought says, okay, let's leave Asia and enter the West. This is the second school. And we have not answer to that question, fundamental question, since 1868. We're still wondering, do we belong to Asia? Do we belong to the West? Even the British ask whether they belong to Europe or not. And I think that's something similar to that. Thank you. Anybody want to try the uh, solution question? Uh, uh, solution, uh, there is no good, the easy solution. But uh, I think uh, many people are talking about the kind of uh, bottom-up cooperation, functional cooperation first, to resolve these, uh, the controversies. I think the other way around, political leaders should uh, engage in a dialogue and then try to make a breakthrough. If not, nobody will move. Uh, in that sense, I think China should be much more prudent, Japan should be much more modest, Korea should be much more flexible. Uh, so the, <laughs> the, uh, and uh, one, more, one more comment I wanted to add is that uh, the, we are talking about all this nationalism. I think, uh, uh, I think it's, it's related to Gil's point uh, in the previous session. Japan should be much more proud of the post-war Japan rather than talking about pre-war Japan, going back to the, the, the retrieving the glory of the past. Japan's glory was in the post-war era, peaceful, democratic, prosperous, stable, and model of the many countries. But if you're talking about going back to the, the kind of uh, modern history, I don't think you can be that, that much proud of. Okay, well, maybe take us back to the uh, 20 seconds to each of you, yeah, yeah. can start. Uh, actually, no, hi history problem. Uh, how many times uh, should, Japan, should Japan apologize? Um, to me, it's a wrong question. Uh, history is to remember. Uh, history cannot be forgot, forgotten by anybody. And particularly for, for suffering people longer. Um, if you uh, look at the, inside Japan, Okinawans, um, Okinawans remember history more uh, longer than uh, Tokyo people. Mm -hmm. So uh, things, uh, important thing is we have to uh, keep remembering uh, the history. And in order to remember the history, we have to learn before. Thank you. Brad, you want to sum us up here in 20 seconds? Um, no. Uh, what I do want to do is follow up on Kuni. I think the younger, Japanese, younger generation of Japanese have reconciled West and Asia. I think that, that, that there, for them the split's not as profound. Again, the research, you, what you see is increasing numbers of young people, business people, et cetera, in Japan saying, our future is in Asia. I mean, that's what the lesson of 311 is. Business supply chains, we've got to go back into, deeper into the region. We want to do it in partnership. We want the alliance with the U.S. is a key part of that. But we are deeper into Asia. And I think that's, you know, they don't have difficulty. They don't see the incongruity of the two positions. As to your question about globalist narrative, I think the reason for that is, is that the people that are most affected positively by globalism are the people that are voiceless. I mean, you look at the hundreds of millions and billions of people whose lives have improved by free trade and the work you guys do as trade negotiators. And it's great. Unfortunately, the costs are typically also borne by people like us that have the microphones. And we're not talking about that. So it's just a fairly unfair kind of situation. But that doesn't mean that the narrative isn't there to be told by somebody, like a journalist, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. And I wonder if we can give our appreciation to the four panelists who had a very difficult topic. <laughs>